them in the morning. There we go. Well, since the recording has started, I think it's probably a good uh, cue to kick the, the meeting off. Welcome to everyone uh, to our, I guess, our second annual virtual work session. Um, and uh, maybe uh, if we're lucky, this will be our last virtual work session. Uh, but I think uh, in both cases last year, and certainly we're looking at the agenda for this year, there's a lot of information to share, a lot to learn, and a lot to talk about. Um, we've got a very full agenda uh, with uh, starting off with a presentation from our colleagues and our supporters at Ancestry and a recognition of Catherine Berenger from Maryland, uh, who's the recipient of the uh, Ancestry Leadership Award. But we've got a number of reports and other things, and I'm not going to go on and on too much. Uh, I'll do a lot of that next week. Uh, at the business meeting. So uh, please make sure that you've got on your agenda for especially for you state archivist folks, uh, make sure you've got on your schedule to come to the business meeting a week from today, because uh, there's a lot to be done at that meeting as well. So without that, I'm just going to give lay out the ground rules one more time. Barbara just uh, put them out there. If you're not talking, we'd really appreciate it if you'd mute your, your line. Um, that would be very, very helpful. Um, if you have a question or want to raise an issue, uh, please put it in the chat and we'll address it as quickly as we can. Um, if it's really urgent, um, just unmute yourself and scream and yell and uh, say you're on fire or something like that. Uh, but beyond that, um, we're going to talk for a little while. At 3.40, we'll take a break uh, for a few minutes because sitting in front of your computer screen for that much time uh, will take the, the wind out of anyone's sails. And then we promise we will wrap this up by five o'clock Eastern time. So um, we'll, uh, we'll keep everyone on task. And so with that, um, it is now time for me to stop talking. So I'm going to turn it over. I'm not sure who from Ancestry is going to be uh, talking, but uh, I see a lot of our colleagues are here. So I'm going to turn it over to whichever one of you is going to lead it. So Ancestry team, take it away. Thank you, Tom. Uh, this is uh, Jared Aikenhead here from Ancestry. Uh, Tom, if you can give me a nod that you can hear me fine. Perfect. Thank you. <clears throat> and again, thank you, Tom, for, for the opportunity uh, to present here. I'm going to share my screen just briefly uh, in, the, in the next uh, few minutes um, uh, as we make this presentation to you. And again, we're looking forward to doing this um, in person at some point. Uh, we miss seeing a lot of your faces, um, and uh, I look forward to meeting those of you who may be new to uh, the archive, uh, Coastal World. Um, but we, we just wanted to present a, a few little things here, and I'll start off if I can, <clears throat> just briefly with this. Okay. So there's been a few updates, um, a few changes here at Ancestry that we just want to make you guys aware of, um, and you may be um, familiar with this. Uh, these changes, um, and if not, uh, you're about to find out. Um, and, uh, and, and like we've all been working in this uh, new environment, um, you know, and, and, and exploring new ideas and ways to communicate and interact and provide access uh, at Ancestry, we've been doing the same thing. Um, and so we'll share some of those insights with you today. <clears throat> First of all, um, we have some new ownership. Um, as you, uh, most of you may be aware, Ancestry is a, a privately held company and occasionally that ownership changes. And um, that happened to us um, at the end of last year. Um, and our new ownership is a company <clears throat> or a, a private equity fund called Blackstone, who are the world's largest private equity fund. You can see a couple of quotes from them. Um, we invest across industries in both established and growth oriented businesses across the globe, and we believe Ancestry has significant runway for further growth as people of all ages and backgrounds become increasingly interested in learning more about their family histories and themselves. That was from the senior managing director, uh, David, there. Um, it, it's, a, <clears throat> it's a great um, thing for us to, to have new ownership in this way um, as they continue to see the expansion of the uh, family history business um, and have uh, identified Ancestry as one of the leading contenders in that, in that field and are happy 
and uh, to help support that <clears throat> those objectives um, moving forward. Second to that, there is, um, sorry, let me see. Um, yeah, second to that, we have a new CEO. Um, her name is Deb Liu, and she comes to us from Facebook, uh, where she created and led Facebook Marketplace, social media sites, classified ad advertisement services um, that has 800 million monthly users. She also found as a founder of Women in Product, a nonprofit network of women in technology, leadership roles. Uh, Lou also held previous positions at PayPal and, and eBay. Um, and so we're excited to have Deb um, on our team. Um, she comes with some uh, amazing experiences um, and leadership skills that we're, um, we're excited to uh, take advantage of. So how does it impact you, right? Uh, we've got we've got a few new changes, um, and I think a couple of the areas where where, where it's really impacting um, our relationship with the archives is is <clears throat> in twofold. One, we have a lot of um, financial backing with this new ownership, who are excited to invest in uh, family history. Um, second to that, Deb has certainly brought a, a level of um, a continued level of expansion um, in the family history side of the business as opposed to our DNA side that continues to be an important role but certainly Deb has looked at uh, our business and is excited about the expansion not only in our core markets but also uh, internationally um, and so there's more records and, and there's more money which is a good thing for everyone because um, you know our, our efforts there in digitizing and helping to provide access uh, digitization services as we've done in the past continues to be um, a key factor for us as we as we move forward. Um, I'll turn some time over to Craig if he can unmute himself and continue in this and we'll go from there. Actually, this is Brian. I'm going to take a minute oh, uh, next and just go through this slide. Uh, Brian Peterson here for those who haven't met us. I know we have a lot of new archivists and and things that we're looking forward to meeting. But um, tagging on to what uh, what Jared just said, we um, we have done some great things, and in the past we have have grown tremendously. But one of the reasons that Blackstone acquired us is that they think that we are just barely scratching the surface of the possibilities and the potential that uh, family history has. And I think some of that was borne out uh, during this COVID period. Uh, it's been some of our busiest time. We've had record engagement because people, uh, as they were stuck at home, had a need to connect and, and a desire to make connections. And, and fortunately, we were in a position to be able to facilitate that for a lot of people who ended up at home with more time on their hands than usual. And uh, and we've reached a point, uh, we have over 30 billion records on our site now, over 28 or 20 million people who have done the DNA test and, and have profiles in our database. And the more that those grow, the, the more people are able to leverage that information and, and find what they're looking for in, in making those connections to their own past and family histories. And, uh, and so with Kind of this infusion of, of new ownership and, and new excitement, um, we feel like there's a long way to go and there's a new excitement uh, at Ancestry. Uh, with that, one of the things that we've really learned over the last few years is that being a, a large data company, um, privacy and security is at the forefront and, and the need is there. And, and some of those breaches and things you've seen in the news of other companies, uh, we, we would like to keep ancestry out of the news for that reason and in the news for for making connections and 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 these amazing stories that that you see um, all the time of, of people finding those lost relatives and things and so we we continue to invest more and more in making sure that of all that great information people share with us the things that are supposed to stay private, uh, are staying private, and uh, and that that is one of our our biggest areas of focus is to make sure that that, that data is safe and secure. Um, and then again, as Jared mentioned, uh, with with Deb coming on and her experience internationally, um, 
with with product and things we're we're really looking to expand for years we've said uh, we want to help everyone to be able to find and share their family stories and their family history and and we say that but we've had some gaps um and and we're trying to really focus on closing those gaps uh, for ethnic groups, for Af African-Americans, Mexican-Americans, Asian-Americans. And, and so that's where you can help us by identifying if, if you have those records, if you have information that we can utilize and, and help you to digitize, to preserve, and to make that more available, um, we would love that because those are areas that we really would like to increase our holdings and, and increase that ability for people of, of those backgrounds to tell their stories. Um, Jared mentioned international expansion and, and we're certainly looking at various ways that we can provide an experience for everyone, no matter where they may live throughout the globe. And so we're doing a lot of things internationally as well with DNA, with content, with um, product experience and, and things and, and people making connections with each other. Um, and last, just from a product, Deb is, a, she comes from the product background and that's an area that, uh, that we probably haven't been as strong in as we would like to. And so Deb is a great fit for us to help with our product experience, our user experience and engagement on the site through some better guided searching, a simplified uh, way for people to interact with the product, uh, making it more mobile friendly and things. And so it's it's really the start of some, some new great initiatives uh, at Ancestry. And then obviously, as Jared mentioned, more content. We have the support of Blackstone to go out and get that content that we need to help people uh, make those discoveries and, and make those rich discoveries, not just the birth, marriage, death records we're still looking for, but all kinds of different stories and categories. And Craig's going to talk a little bit more about those. But uh, we, um, we're looking forward to engaging with you as circumstances allow, as the uh, requirements and regulations and, and safety guidelines allow for it. Um, we want to come out and, and to pay you a visit. And, and I'll wrap up with a little bit more of that after Craig's done. But uh, on to Craig. Thank you, Brian. Hi, everyone. We, we are really a very appreciative to the State Archives and the collaboration that we've had with you over the many years. And we continually see many State Archives working hard to assist in the preservation of historical records within their own facilities. And in my conversations with many of you, I, I've learned how many organizations you work with and offer expert, expert training and assistance in a variety of ways to offer entities so that includes both state, agen state agencies and county offices about the importance of preserving their historical records. And we appreciate all that you do in that effort. And of course, we're grateful when we've been able to combine our resources and expertise without cost to your state archives in that same effort. As you know, we're still seeing such a variety of ways that these historical records are at risk of being lost. Does it surprise us anymore when we learn about a fire within a county or court office anymore? <laughs> uh, this was the case where we were, just been, we, were, we were just finishing scanning the Galveston County marriage records in Texas when an employee's cubicle caught on fire in the upper part of that court building. As a result, the amount of water damage that came from the sprinklers that put the fire out was very extensive, it's damaging a variety of the records. And we were glad to report to them that we could uh, return to them the entire digital format that we had created up to that point, and that the additional two boxes left and remaining were in a safe and secure place where they can be scanned. So it's just one more example where that demonstrates, again, that in an instant, such treasured historical records are at risk of being lost forever. And it, it also demonstrates the timeline we have to try and do our best to preserve them. We're back to scanning again. We're glad we can announce that as we've been um, increasing the number of scanners that are located without, throughout the US. Right now, we're in 10 locations, and that's about, about to increase with more to come. 
Um, there are some locations where we've needed to pause for COVID at this time, yet overall our scanners have been in safe and secure places to scan historical documents throughout 2021. What's new to our to archives acquisitions? We we wanted to share with you some things that we're doing um, with, with you, and, and as we've spoken with many of you in our state archives, we've we've learned how you're continuing to expand your own digital collections, creating both images and indexes, and in some cases, very robust indexes. I've been amazed at what I've seen at times, and and that's to better help your patrons and staff effectively search through a variety of collections. Uh, I'm just sharing just a few examples of the wonderful digital collections that you're, you're providing online, and that includes vital records, tax records, school censuses. Well, what, a, what a remarkable thing that was to find that. <laughs> it was kind of hidden, but I found that to be a real, really unique collection for uh, patrons to enjoy. Prison records, um, employment records, such as those that come from state licensure records. Um, city and state censuses have been put up online. And the list goes on and on and on. Uh, you've done a great job in, in providing those out online. And we, we appreciate those of you that have shared some of these digital collections with Ancestry, as well as we continue to work with you on ways that are beneficial to your state archives in return. And that's important to us. How could we help you? Jared said, how, how, could, how does this impact you? It's, it's beyond that which is considered a cash value. We look at it, how can we help you meet many of your own your own main objectives some of the new categories that that we've been offering to assist state archives with this year in digitization of their records include ethnic records brian just mentioned african-american hispanic records there's many others i'm working with some others from norwegian records in the u.s there's a variety of places where these are at and perhaps in your own state archives um, church registries, family histories is a, it's a unique category. We've been doing a lot in that area of looking at family history books that might be held as well. Um, local and county naturalizations. If you have those, we're interested in working with you as well. We can work with you in a variety of ways. I think it, it's important to emphasize we always do this without cost um, to scan from paper, microfilm, and microfiche. Um, whether it's been about a while since we've, since we've worked with you or not, um, we're continually exploring with you how we can help your organizations in a way that we hope is beneficial to your main objectives. Um, and one of those ways in, this, in an example to this is we've, as we've collaborated with, with many of your state archives, we've offered a free worldwide Subscribe, subscription to an Ancestry Institution account for your patrons and your staff to access their own state and or US related records and all the collections that, have, that, have, that we have on our Ancestry network worldwide. And that's a benefit to be able to put that in your own state archives at no cost on, on behalf of those that have worked with us. And we hope we can continue to do that um, to others that may not have that have had that opportunity. At this time, we'd also like to share with you a little idea of what um, what we have by way of a short video. But uh, first of all, just express to you our gratitude and how grateful we are for the opportunity to sponsor and be part of this work session with you, and uh, appreciate all all that you do. Um, in this short video, um, it's just about how. Uh, the impact that someone that everyone really can have by making connections to family history that can enhance our family relationships through the meaningful stories that we discover and share with others. So we'll have Jared start the video for you and then Brian will close with a few thoughts at the end. Jared, you're muted, so we can't hear anything. Have helped our members make billions of meaningful connections. Those are more than names and dates. They're relatives, homes, hardships, and triumphs that all become part of the rich stories we share. And while
while you're connecting to your family, we're working to make your discoveries easier and more rewarding. We're evolving how DNA shows who you're connected to. We're simplifying the ways you keep track of family, old and new. And we're helping to fuel your breakthroughs by always listening to you, improving everything we do to serve you better. Because your family's story has always been our priority. Imagine what's possible when we connect it all together. We just wanted to say thanks again. Uh, we feel, I'm sure, like many of you, kind of this disconnect over the last year and a half. And, and that's been hard for us because we're, we're very used to being out uh, among you in your archives and, and visiting with you and, and seeing what we can do together. And, and I see a lot of familiar names, but I also see a lot of new names. I don't know, um, Tom or Ann or Barbara, how many new archivists are there in the last year and a half? Do we know that number? Um, we'll have that at the business meeting. Oh, okay. I'm counting, um, I'm counting as we speak. Still counting. So we just wanted to, to say to, to those who are new, um, we've been a, a part of the COSA family and, and we feel grateful for that for, for many years now, over 10 years now. And, and we're very appreciative of, of that relationship. And as I mentioned, we, we would love to get out to visit with you, those who we've been out to, and it's been a few years, and those who we've never met with because you're new. Um, we, we're looking forward to that opportunity and, and we wanna, we'll be reaching out to do that. Uh, I won't be seeing as many of you. I'm taking on um, or have been working on some more category specific things that aren't state archive specific. So I'm still around, but uh, not doing as much directly with the, the archives, um, but I'm, I'm still here. And, and for those who I've worked with or who have questions, and things happy to help, but Jared, Craig will, will be there in your archives, visiting with you, looking at your needs, and any of us can are more than happy and willing and able to, to help with things that uh, you have questions about or, or concerns that you may have. So uh, again, just to thank you to all of you, uh, we're gonna give you a few minutes back um, from what was planned and, and we wanted to, to do that, but uh, thanks from Ancestry for your support and all you do for us. Well, and Brian, thank you uh, and, and Craig and Jared for making the trek to this meeting. Um, uh, this, this year I know was especially difficult, but, uh, but we hope we will miss you. And we hope that when we are able to do this in person, uh, Brian, you'll be able to join us again just to, to maintain that connection. And Ancestry has been uh, part of the COSA family for a very long time. And it's interesting, we use the term family in this context, but uh, you've been great supporters of us. and. I know speaking from my own state archives here in New York, the work and the partnership that we've had with you uh, has enabled us to flourish to some extent during these past 16 months. And uh, it's helped us in, in many ways. And I'm sure many of my colleagues uh, would echo that sentiment. So again, thank you. And thanks for all the background and the information you provided. Um, we're, we're, we're happy you're here and uh, look forward to seeing you maybe in person uh, and uh, but certainly uh, we'll talk over the course of the next year or so. So you have given us back a couple of minutes. Now I've stolen one or two of them, uh, but I'm going to turn it over uh, to Catherine Berenger from the Maryland State Archives, who is, <clears throat> pardon me, our Ancestry Leadership Award recipient for this year. Um, and uh, Catherine's got a presentation and I'm going to stop talking so that she can start. Thank you. I'm not muted, am I? No, okay, excellent. First, I just wanna thank you all so much for this award. It, it's enabled me to learn a lot. And because the award was so generous, I was able to take two online training courses, ARMA's Professional Leadership Certificate and also AIM's File Share Cleanup Quick Study. The professional leadership certificate was broken into five courses, coaching, communication, time management, 
negotiation and conflict resolution and motivation. And I was able to get useful information from every one of these sections. I particularly like the coaching section because I learned as a manager, you're not expected just to manage your staff in terms of training them and administratively overseeing them. Today, managers are also expected to coach their employees to improve their job performance and their morale. So this training session talked a lot about the skills that help you coach like empathy and listening. It also covered common hurdles that lead to poor performance or maybe reluctant learners. They also spent a lot of time teaching you about the different styles of learning and also the different styles of management to talk about how the different styles might mesh or might clash and how you might need to adjust your style based on the audience. Communication, of course, is key. The training covered all the main communication styles and how they mix. I was particularly interested in how they addressed both sides of communication, both the sender of the communication and the receiver of communication and your role in both of those parts. Because communication is only successful if both the sender and the receiver agree that the message meant the same thing. I'm always looking for time management tips with all the different projects I have going on. So this training covered the most popular methodologies for goal setting, prioritization, planning. It also gave you tips for overcoming those common stumbling blocks, whether they be internal like procrastination or external like there's way too many meetings. With negotiation and conflict resolution, um, I never really thought of myself as a negotiator, but the common strategies that they provided in this training are the kind of things that you can apply in any situation where you are trying to get the cooperation and the collaboration of somebody who has a different goal than you do. With the conflict resolution, uh, I like that it showed you how to pick your battles to kind of help define which of those conflicts that you could let slide and avoid and which of those conflicts that you really needed to face head on. And it gave you different strategies for facing those conflicts. The motivation portion was specifically designed for motivating volunteers to continue to volunteer. But what they provided, I think, is applicable to paid employees as well. Uh, the key points that they hit on was that the, the volunteer needs clear direction in what they're supposed to be doing, the tools necessary to accomplish that. But more, they need a sense of investment in what they're doing, a, a sense that they're having an impact that they have the ability to solve problems, to make the process better, and to be uh, personally invested and also able to learn and grow as they're working. The file share cleanup course was a quick study. So it was very much, you know, basic quickly to the bottom line of defining what a file share is, what a file share cleanup is, how to do it step by step taking you all the way from, you know, justifying it to your boss, to the planning, to the actual doing it, uh, and then wrapping it up with how to do it so that you don't have to continue to do it again and again as the years go on. I had a number of key takeaways from this uh, training. There was particularly helpful information in how to easily categorize records into larger groups and from those larger groups be able to more easily appraise them um, by providing a list of questions you can ask to determine what can you go ahead and destroy right away, what needs to be kept, and for how long. Um, based on the training, uh, I also thinking that I want to start small here. I'm looking forward to attacking my own departmental shared space before moving on to any kind of agency-wide project. So that's a summary of the training. If anybody wants to contact me for more, more specific information, here's my email address. I'm happy to talk more about it. But again, thank you so much for this opportunity.
Well, and thank you, Catherine. That, that it, it's inspiring to hear you talk so positively about that training and how it's been useful to you. Now, the, the Ancestry Leadership Award uh, helps COSA fulfill our obligation to next generation leadership development. Mm -hmm. And just like making sure that the message and the, mes the messenger and the, the sender understand what's happening, that makes a perfect connection. You demonstrated to us that our commitment and our support from Ancestry to you and your colleagues who are emerging leaders in, in our business are getting the kinds of opportunities to learn and grow and improve. So thank you. And we're so grateful that you took us up on this opportunity and that it was beneficial to you. Oh, emerging leaders. I like that. I'm going to put that on my, uh, <laughs> on my curriculum vitae. Perfect. Perfect. Catherine Berenger, emerging leader. Um, so thank you all. Thank you very much. And uh, again, Brian, Jared, Craig, thank you again. And uh, we'll look forward to talking to you and hopefully seeing all three of you in person maybe a year from now. So now we're going to turn uh, our attention to a couple of updates from our colleagues. And we're going to start off with uh, hearing from Meg Phillips from the National Archives. And Meg has been phenomenal in these past, I'm going to say this past year and bringing together a number of us to talk about issues of uh, and share concerns and share information. Um, I think it's a quarterly meeting that she puts together and she may or may not talk about that, but uh, I can say how personally grateful and I think uh, my colleagues uh, and, uh, at COSA can also attest to how wonderful it is to have a great partner like Meg Phillips. So I'm not gonna talk anymore and uh, now I'm gonna have Meg Phillips, the external affairs liaison at the National Archives, uh, give us an update, Meg. Thank you so much, Tom. Um, could you give me a thumbs up if you can hear me okay? Excellent, that's fantastic. So thank you for inviting me to provide an update on NARA. I really appreciate the opportunity to bring you up to date and hopefully spend a little time talking about what we might be able to do together. And I did have those meetings at the end of my, at the end of my report and I'd love to talk more about, you know, better ways, additional ways that COSA and NARA can work together. So my updates today are going to focus on some very high level developments. The first one is NARA's update to its draft, uh, update to its strategic plan now in draft. I'm going to talk about our response to COVID, of course, and our current reopening status. I also want to touch on our um, work related to racial equity, diversity and inclusion, which is very um, top of mind for us right now. And finally, I want to talk to you about lots of other opportunities we might have to work together. So my goal is to talk for not the whole time you gave me, but maybe leave a little bit of time for questions and answers at the end. The other thing I'd like to do is um, maybe interrupt myself to drop some links in chat. I do not have slides. So um, feel free to follow my links um, while I'm talking. So the first thing I want to talk to you about is NARA's update to its strategic plan. NARA has posted its new draft strategic plan on its website, and it's inviting feedback from the public and particularly from our colleagues in the archives world. We really, really appreciate getting a thoughtful, uh, a thoughtful read from our colleagues in the state archives because you guys are so parallel to what we do. Um, we also invite COSA members to join us at our virtual public town hall, which is a relatively unusual thing for the National Archives to do. But we're offering this um, virtual town hall on August 17th at one o'clock Eastern, um, where you can hear NARA leaders introduce the draft plan and talk about the goals that they're most directly working on, and also answer questions or provide comments on the draft plan as you've read it so far. So the first link I'm gonna drop in is the invitation uh, the press release inviting the general public to this town hall. It would be really fabulous to have you guys there. So this plan reaffirms major elements of our current strategic plan, which covered 2018 through 2022. Um, so many of the major pieces are continuing from that plan into this plan. For example, our mission, vision, values, and the transformational outcomes and our strategic goals remain essentially the same. There are a few modifications, which we will point out to you in the town hall. However, this draft updates our strategic objectives to focus on improving equity and provide a world-class customer experience for all of our customers. 
Uh, we also want to use our experience during the years of pandemic to accelerate agency modernization, which I think is probably another thing that's going to sound familiar to, to people in state archives. So we're committing to new outreach to traditionally underserved communities. Um, and we really want to work with them to identify NARA records that are most important to them, to their communities. NARA plans to prioritize the re those records for archival processing, description, digitization, and online access. This draft plan also revitalizes NARA's customer service activities, um, proposing agency-wide objectives to better understand our customers' needs and expectations and to modernize the services that we're offering for them. Finally, the draft strategic plan challenges NARA programs and agency records management functions to continue modernization activities that were started during the COVID-19 pandemic. NARA recognizes that making more of its work processes electronic and more of our services available online will allow the agency to fulfill its mission remotely and make us more resilient over time because we're not sure that this is over. We're not sure this is never going to happen again. So resilience is good. We're also committing to modernizing our records management policies to keep pace with the changes in how federal agencies are creating and managing electronic records today, um, particularly in a, in a largely working from home environment. So all, all federal agencies have to issue a new strategic plan every four years. This draft plan um, was shared with the National Archives staff on July 28th. And now it's open for public comment. And the basic timeline is that we're accepting written public comments either on our website or on our GitHub site. And links to both of those are in the press release. Um, I see that Barbara also shared the press release, which, which is awesome, the invitation. Um, so written comments are welcome through August 20th. Um, we have to provide the draft that results from those comments to the Office of Management and Budget by September 13th. Um, we'll do another revision after we get feedback from OMB. We may have a chance to integrate additional feedback from the public if we didn't get to everything that came in. And we'll deliver the final version of our strategic plan to OMB in February of 2020. Uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> 2022. I'm slipping back and forth in time. Um, so that's where we stand on the strategic plan. So the next thing I want to talk to you about is our COVID operating status, which has been um, really Hey, Meg, we lost your uh, voice. Darn it. There we go. Now you're back. I'm back. Gosh, I'm sorry. How long was I gone? Only about you were three just words. starting to tell us about your operating status under COVID. Oh, good. Oh, just seconds. Okay, good. I was like, I've been talking to myself for five minutes. Okay, so um, the first thing you need to understand is that we're operating under government wide, federal government wide standards for safe reopening. So the measure that we're looking at is greater than 200 new cases per day in any locality um, per 100,000 of population or greater than 10% test positivity rate over the past 14 days. So that's the measure that we're monitoring and that has driven us in our reopening, which had gotten pretty far up through July and unfortunately is now starting to drive some reclosures, which is discouraging as you can imagine. So we recently issued uh, a re-entry plan and reopening plan, which um, got us into phase three, which is public services in mid-July. Um, and um, in, as of mid-July, all 40 of NARA's facilities were open to staff and 33 facilities met the public health standards um, to be able to progress to phase three and open the general public to research rooms and museums. Um, today, unfortunately, 14 facilities are closed to both staff and the public, and 37 facilities are in areas of higher substantial community transmission. Just three facilities have public health metrics that would support progression to phase three. So the museums and research rooms that are currently open to the public are going to remain open to the public, but we have um, had to tamp back our optimism about our reopening more broadly to phase three. Um, we also, as I'm sure you've heard in the news, just received substantial new guidance from the administration requiring all federal agency staff to either be vaccinated or submit to regular COVID testing. So that's a, a mandate that the National Archives now has to implement 
and we need to figure out how to do that. So that's something we had not been doing up to now. So we need to work out the processes for that. So I'm gonna share another link um, where you can follow our opening status here. It's our main coronavirus resource page. And that provides links to other places on our website where you can go for additional information about what our current operating status is. I also wanna say just a few words about um, something that we've been watch walking, wa watching particularly carefully because we're very sensitive to the needs of veterans to access their records stored at the National Personnel Records Center in St. Louis. Uh, we've been working closely with the VA. We've gotten additional congressional funding to increase our ability to respond to requests while also protecting the health of staff. So some of the things that we've done is started running um, twice as many staff in the NPRC in two completely separate shifts. So we could maintain the standards for social distancing during that time. We've got shifts running on the weekends. Um, we're issuing laptops and digitizing records as fast as we can to get as many efficiencies as we, efficiencies as we can with NPRC. But um, there are a lot of paper records in that warehouse and we have developed a significant backlog. And unfortunately, the public health the situation in St. Louis has also forced us to ramp back the number of staff, the density of staff we can have in that building. So this is something that we're really concerned about and we're working on very, very hard. If you have additional questions about what we're doing there, I'm happy to field them at the end. So um, I'm gonna spend a few minutes talking about um, our equity work now. Uh, many of you were probably following this as it developed over time, but um, archivist David Ferriero chartered the Task Force on Racism in October of 2020 to address racial inequality, both in our customer facing organizations and um, internally for our own staff. Since then, three teams of NARA staff were focused on um, museum programs, archival description, and the staff experience and our recruiting experience in particular. And the recommendations of that task force were published in a final report in April. At that point, the Archivist of the United States accepted the recommendations. So um, I'm gonna interrupt myself and quickly um, share another link. So um, that happened in April and we were starting to work on the task force recommendations um, that, that were their highest priorities. But at the same time, the Biden administration issued an executive order, um, executive order 13985, advancing racial equity and support for underserved communities through the federal government. And that executive order um, put another structure of requirements and guidelines and goals um, that we also need to um, uh, fulfill. So because of our work the previous year on the task force on racism, we were kind of ready to go. We knew what we wanted to submit um, as part of a government wide plan. But now we're kind of operating off two sets of goals that we're trying to fit, fit within each other. Um, but we're using the, the structure of the executive order um, to put together an equity team to name uh, an executive in charge of our equity efforts. And we're fo focusing on just a few of the, the task forces recommendations, which were much broader. Um, so that we're gonna be focusing on um, archival description, reparative description, digitization of records of particular interest to underserved communities, and also um, our NHPRC grants program. So those are the three things that we're managing under the equity goals of the executive order. However, there was lots else that we were also able to do even outside that um, executive order framework, which we have started working on already, or we had started working on already. And those include our fiscal 22 budget request, um, which we used to make equity a centerpiece. We put in a funding request for additional staff for recruiting underserved and underrepresented um, uh, uh, archivists into the National Archives family. And we're also starting a new NHPRC grant program, or we've requested funding for a new grant program specifically to digitize the, the records of historically black colleges and universities. And the last thing that I wanna mention under that programming is that 
um, the archivist has requested funding from the National Archives Foundation to start rethinking the rotunda, which is you know, the big national shrine where we have the constitution, the declaration and the bill of rights. So we have traditionally called that space uh, or those documents, the charters of freedom. And if you walk into the rotunda, it is difficult to tell that there are Americans that are not um, 18th century white men, basically. So um, we're really hoping to get funding from the foundation to make that space more reflective of the diversity of American stories that were important even in the founding of the country. So to make that, that space welcoming and inclusive because it has such symbolic significance for the United States as a whole. All right, so I'm, I'm using up more time than I intended, I apologize. Um, the last thing I wanna say is that um, the National Archives really, really values this partnership with COSA. And uh, Tom mentioned one of the things that we started doing after the pandemic shut down most of our travel and in-person meetings. And that's that I have started um, convening and coordinating a series of quarterly meetings for the main archives organizations in the United States. So COSA, SAA, NAGARA, and also the Regional Archival Associations Consortium, the RAC. And we have a chance to provide updates to each other about what our priorities are, but also at Tom's suggestion, I will say, uh, we've started focusing each meeting on a particular discussion theme. And that's been really, really helpful. So the last one was about archival advocacy. And I think that was really fruitful. And Tom, thank you for the suggestion. Um, we've also continued the pattern of um, more or less quarterly Cosa Nara webinars. And I'd love to hear your feedback on whether those webinars are useful and if they're meeting the original goal. And some of you may remember that the original goal of those webinars was to better connect um, National Archives archivists who are doing the real work with state archives archivists doing parallel work. So we wanted to sort of help connect the, the state and federal levels around real archival topics. So that was the, the, the goal, as well as just sharing information. So um, let me know if you think that is working, if that's helpful, if there's more we could do, or if there are particular topics that you'd like to see us address. So with that, I'll, um, uh, I, I think I went over my time and I'm really uh, sorry about that, but I would love to hear your questions and thoughts uh, about anything, anything that we um, have been doing over the past year and that we see ourselves doing in the future. Thank you so much for inviting me. Meg, thank you for coming. And believe it or not, you did not go over your time. You underspent it. So you have a, a couple of minutes. Does anyone have a, a urgent question that they'd like to raise to Meg? Um, but if not, I can attest that she is always very accessible and uh, very responsive if you reach out to her. So. I'm going to drop a couple more links in here that I uh, did not uh, get to while I was talking. And um, I hope you'll peruse them at your leisure. One is the, one is the executive order. And the last is actually the topic for our, our next Narcosa webinar. Um, and I see that I'm getting some questions in chat. Thank you very much. Great. Well, again, thank you very much, Meg. Um, and we're very fortunate we have uh, Chris Eck and Dan Stokes joining us today from the NHPRC. Chris is the executive director and we've all worked with Dan uh, for a few years, I'll just say that. Um, so uh, I'm just going to turn it over to, I'm not sure which one of you is going to start, but uh, we'd love to hear an update from the NHPRC before we take a break. Well, I'll start. Um... Can, can you all hear me? This is Chris. All right, great. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I know that this has been, a, as everyone's been talking about, a challenging year for many of you, as it has been for us for the last year and a half. Uh, one of the things that we've been able to do over the last year and a half since the archive shut down in March of last year was make sure that we continued to allow the services that the NHPRC provides to continue. We knew that it was going to be important that the money that the commission provides in terms of the grants it awards was going to take a special importance. And we were fortunate, probably better than most, that we were prepared largely with our small staff to telework. Um, 
and I'll let Dan talk about that a little more. He's been the he's been the one that's had the most challenge, and he's been the one member that's gone more frequently into the office than anyone. Um, and I'll just touch upon the fact that um, we were already ready by virtue of the commission meetings that we that we hold. Uh, when we meet semi-annually, we have uh, our May meeting and summer meeting, as many of you know, where we consider the grants that are to be awarded. And we were already prepared with laptops, unlike a, a number of the other sections of the National Archives. And with that, you know, we've worked through, as many of you have, the hiccups that comes with utilizing technology on, a, on an everyday basis, particularly in a distant format. Um, but largely, we've been able to adapt to the telework uh, without any real problem. And fortunately, over this time, we've been able to meet three times as a commission, led by Archivist of the United States, David Ferriero as chair, uh, to be able to push out more than $10 million at a time, as, as all of you know, it's been greatly needed. Probably one of the people that uh, many of you are familiar with, if you've reached out in recent days and haven't uh, been able to get a hold of, is, uh, is the Deputy Director Lucy Barber. I just want to let everyone know that she's been out on extended medical leave, and uh, she is doing better. She doesn't have COVID. But if you've tried to reach out to Lucy um, and haven't been able to reach her now, you know why. Uh, and you can always reach out to me or others on staff uh, to continue to any, any questions um, that you may have about any of our programs. With that, I'll, I'll touch back on some of the other points I want to mention, but I also wanted to uh, let Dan speak first uh, before I go into more and let Dan talk about some of the things he wants to cover. Okay, thank you very much. Is, can you all hear me? I'm on the telephone here. Um, yes. I, I'm at yes. Uh, the National Archives building with my with my uh, vintage computer that has no camera or microphone. So uh, doing it the, the old fashioned way here. I'm glad to see the big crowd we've had, that's nice. I wanted to go through a few things with you, um, some of which relate to what Meg has said about uh, NARA's work in long-range planning and also in just um, other areas such as equity. Uh, the commission adopted its own long-range plan uh, a few months ago, and parts of it do talk about areas in which um, we want to work with state archives and state boards um, to carry out some of the uh, goals and objectives. One area I, I kind of worked um, on with the uh, strategic plan was to not lump state archives and state boards together as if they do the same thing and have the same resources and have the same capabilities, that they are separate entities that are linked uh, in some ways, but are are not um, should not be considered the same. So that way we've been able to separate out some areas that the state boards will help us with and some areas that state archives can help us with. Uh, one of the goals of the plan, and some of these areas of goals and objectives and, and tactics are somewhat repetitive in that similar activities do fall under uh, different objectives. Uh, the first goal, expanding public discovery and use of historic records, um, is kind of the basics of what the commission seeks to do. Um, its objectives are to broaden preservation of dis and discovery of diverse collections and to collaborate for the virtual uh, unification of records from multiple repositories. And uh, the regrant and traveling archivist programs of the state boards um, are now and in the future, we hope even more can, can address these areas. Uh, we're going to be encouraging boards to design their publicity for their programming to ensure that they're reaching out to all parts of the state and all types of repositories. Um, some states send us maps showing where they've been active, either giving regrants or visiting repositories with traveling archivists, and they do demonstrate that they are able to cover most areas in the state, which is, is useful. Others are having trouble with certain areas that are maybe very rural or it's a long distance between repositories and it's hard to uh, provide them with assistance. 
So, we're, but we're looking at ways to help uh, deal with that situation. And also seeking out projects that help to document racial, ethnic, and other communities, as well as issues of importance to the state, making sure that regrant applications come from a variety of, uh, of institutions that document a variety of different um, areas. Uh, one example of this is uh, not too long ago, um, we had some applications from Western states that had records documenting various areas related to water, which is an important issue, and uh, how different businesses dealt with it, how citizens groups and advocacy groups dealt with it. And uh, we funded a few projects with that. So thinking not only about people, but also issues as you look out to, to make sure that you're uh, dealing with the diverse areas. Uh, both state boards and state archives, uh, we hope will help us reach out to repositories in their states and even colleagues in other states to apply under the major initiatives grant program. And we'll have a new announcement for that coming out in November. This is related to the uh, virtual unification of records where you might be able to work across state lines to develop projects that cover a certain issue or a certain group of people or whatever uh, needs to be documented. This has been, um, one area has, has been uh, in the area of uh, slave records and things like that that have, have been in multiple states and we've brought them together as virtual collections. Uh, a second goal is fostering diversity of voices and telling the American story. Uh, this is both for your grant programs and for our grant programs, getting a greater diversity and inclusion of applicants, uh, greater diversity in among people in the archives and records management professions, a uh, more diverse pool of applicants from all over the country, not just covering areas of interest, but also areas of the country. Physically, there are several states. Um, I believe it's 19 states that have received over the last few years either zero or one grants from us. And we'd like to, to do a little better than that. Uh, that's not including the state board grants, but we'd like to get them from institutions, other institutions as well. So we are gonna to wanna to work to improve that uh, coverage of the country. And then also another objective is better methods and tools designed for small repositories. And areas where uh, we will be seeking assistance from both state boards and state archives is uh, you helping us identify those repositories that hold these types of collections so we can reach out to them either individually or as groups. We are uh, working as much as we can to increase the time commitment of the staff to doing outreach um, in order to uh, not be so reactive to what comes in our door, but proactive to help uh, get the things that type of applications we'd like to receive. Um, also to target uh, programming to promote institutional advancement for small and underserved uh, repositories, including historically black colleges and universities and Hispanic serving institutions and tribal entities. So that if you have a regrant program or a scholarship program or a traveling archivist or um, educational programs or scholarships, uh, that those are targeted toward particular audiences as well as the general archival field. And um, increasing outreach about training opportunities and professional development scholarships to uh, black indigenous and people of color. Uh, many of you have either you offer workshops or you offer scholarships for people to attend workshops. And um, we, we'd like to, hear from you about ways that you can reach out to a, a nice uh, broad audience to make sure that uh, all different types of people are working, um, are taking advantage of what you're having to offer. Uh, third goal is to, this is um, one that we've been working on for decades, connecting the national archives with the nation's archives. So this is about developing partnerships with the state archives and the state boards and broadening 
uh, field-wide sharing of best practices, tools, and methodologies. One area we've found is that um, often boards will create uh, resources that can be used by small repositories that are designed specifically for them, and they don't get shared very widely. And so uh, we want to not only do that, but also find out from you good ways of making them available, uh, putting them on you know, 25 different places um, doesn't seem like the best solution. So finding a way um, to make those available so people know where they are. Um, another strengthening issue is public engagement with collections. We, we've been struggling with this quite a bit of not just uh, processing collections and then saying, we're done, but reaching out to the public so that they know what archivists are doing, um, what collections are available, how those can be used. Um, we also are looking at collaboratives among small underserved organizations that may just be among those groups or may have a leading institution such as uh, a, a large historical society or a college and university or some other group. Uh, we received quite a few. Well, last year we received two applications for our archives collaboratives, and this year we received 13. So uh, that's becoming more interesting to pe people, I think. And those are designed to help uh, folks uh, increase their abilities and contribute to often statewide uh, online repositories who can't put things up online themselves. And then like we mentioned before, the professional development and training opportunities, making sure that all different types of folks are aware of those. Uh, another area is strengthening partnerships with the state archives to make state and local government records more accessible. Um, we've done, we've had some success with the uh, legal records uh, initiative that we had where several states either preserved and provided online access to state records or county records held by the state archives. So that has worked well to uh, in that area, but we want to also hear about other types of records um, that you think um, you would like to receive funding for. The last goal uh, engage the American people in preserving records to tell the American st story. Um, this is about more people sharing their knowledge, students becoming educated about how to use, here's the key, to use authentic and reliable primary sources, and citizens better able to preserve and share their own historical records. We've had some state boards that have done uh, scanning sessions where the public can bring in records. Um, and those have, have done well and have done not so well. Uh, so we're still learning about how to do those uh, as well as possible. And um, encourage grantees to engage students in broader public uh, and the broader public in the work of archives. This is being done uh, pretty well through programs like History Day uh, Awards, the Texas Awards, and a general awards program in Georgia that, that highlights people who have used records for various uh, projects, both students and adults, uh, to kind of highlight here's just regular old people using records and not, not necessarily scholars, but people who are finding uses for records. Uh, this is an area where I think our, the regrant program has been missing out a bit. Uh, most of those projects provide little publicity about their projects. They don't reach out to the public or to the schools near them or, or other audiences, which um, has been um, a bit problematic, and we're going to try and, and improve that. Um, the regrant program is uh, uses a lot of resources, so we want to make sure that it's it's being shared as broadly as possible. This last year, we made 18. Re uh, state board awards for $655,000, and 10 of those involved regrant projects that received $304,000. So you can see quite a bit of funding is going into those, and we want to make sure we know we know what they're doing 
and that others know what is going on. So that is why I'm drafting some uh, regrant program instructions that I hope will be useful to the board so that they can uh, have an idea of what we're looking for and can share that information with um, their regrant recipients so that they can write reports that provide that information so we, we spend less time uh, running back and forth trying to find out what the projects actually did. So that's uh, a few boards have already agreed to, to look at the draft and talk among their boards or um, share it with the boards so that we can get their thoughts on if this is useful information or if they think this is asking too much of what are sometimes very small repositories with limited resources and how much uh, activity we can expect from them. Um, also, uh, I've been getting a little more activity meeting with boards. Most recently, I met with Texas and Illinois and Wyoming uh, and enjoyed doing that. So I am available for meetings. Um, some I attend just part of, some I attend the whole meeting. Um, and I'm willing to do either of those. Uh, so that's available if you uh, want me to uh, either provide certain information or just sit in and make any comments uh, related to uh, the board discussions. So I will let Chris use our remaining three minutes. All right. Thanks, Dan. Um, yeah, we're, we we certainly ate up the time uh, Meg left for us. So thanks, Meg. Uh, I'll just say that uh, one of the highlights that I wanted to bring up that touches upon some of the things that Dan spoke about, um, and it's not necessarily just directed to the states, but just a new program for you, all of you to be aware. Uh, Daryl Meadows, our director for publishing, uh, recently was awarded $2.35 million from the Mellon Foundation for um, a new NHPRC Mellon grant program in publishing. And the, it is to foster, um, it, it goes along with the effort that we have in our strategic plan to foster a new generation of collaborative digital editions uh, in African-American, Asian-American, Hispanic-American, and Native American history. And it's going to actually, in the coming uh, months, we're looking to hire a part-time fellow. So be on the lookout for an announcement that, came, that may come out for that. And we'll also be putting out an outreach effort where I'll be sending out letters to all of you uh, just to invite uh, questions and, and dialogue from you and to encourage your assistance in helping us spread the word of the programs we have at, here at the NHPRC. So thank you. Well, thank, thank you both very, very much. We appreciate that. We appreciate all that you do. Uh, and especially we appreciate this feedback um, and this, this information. Um, I think if my colleagues have questions, we know how to get a hold of you. Um, and I'm sure we, we do often. So uh, again, Thank you. It is uh, 39 past the hour right now. And so we have scheduled a five minute break, which hopefully is enough time for all of you. So at 45 after the hour, because the hour is different all over the place, um, we'll, uh, we'll reconvene and we'll try to do that at, four, at uh, 45 sharp, okay? So go take a break, come back. We're gonna see you in five minutes.
All right. Well, it's been five minutes, and so hopefully uh, everyone is back. Um, as Barbara has just put in the chat, if you have any questions for any of the speakers, so we've got some time allocated at the end of the session today uh, for uh, Q&A, but we might be able to answer some questions offline in, a, in another context if needed. So please feel free to use the chat. Um, and as we've said, um, all, all of the folks that have spoken today, uh, we all have a good connection with them. We're happy to, uh, if, we, we, if you don't have access to them, we can somehow put you in touch with them. So in the interest of keeping things uh, moving along, um, if there are any questions anybody has right now, we'll take them up. Otherwise, um, I'm really happy to introduce Anthony Smith, who's the Associate Deputy Director um, at, the, at IMLS uh, for discretionary uh, grants. Um, so, um, Anthony, I hope that you're, you're here. And uh, I was looking through the list of attendees. Um, but uh, without any further conversation from me, uh, Anthony Smith. Um, Tom, I did not see him on the attendee list. I, I didn't either, Barbara. So I'll send, I just checked, I'll send him a message. Um, okay. Maybe we could, so that. Yeah, why don't we just flip, flip things around a little bit? Does that sound okay? okay? That sounds good. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, so uh, Chris Prong and Ruby Martinez, um, who are great partners with us um, on the email archiving uh, project that we were very fortunate to partner with them and be part of a bigger uh, national project that they're leading out of the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana. Um, Chris and Ruby have uh, agreed to come and talk to us a little bit about the project and uh, bring us up to, to speed and maybe answer a couple of questions. So I know you're we're a little bit off on the agenda, but uh, Chris and Ruby, are you uh, available to chat for a little bit? Uh, I'm definitely here, Tom. I don't know if Ruby is on. Um, I can check with her. I saw her earlier on the attendee list, but she might have stepped away. It was a short break. I'll just a second. I'll check with her. Okay. Yeah, while we're waiting for her, though, I can... Um, can just uh, basically start by thanking you here. I'm really happy to be here speaking with, with you and Kosa and with State Archives community and State Archivists. Um, it's, it's a wonderful uh, partnership that we have with Kosa with, uh, with the grant that Michelle will tell you a little bit more about in a moment. Um, but generally speaking, we wanted to give you some background information on the grant program that the University of Illinois is running here with, uh, with my leadership and with Ruby's participation as the email archives, building cap community capacity and community fellow. Um, as, as all of you know, email archiving is a particular challenge that a lot of organizations face, not only in government archives, but also in museum, academic archives, community archives, and so on and so forth. And our grant program is really intended to meet that need and to build a broader email archiving community. So Ruby, are you are you here? Yes, I'm here. Sorry about that. Great. That's no problem. I'd like to just turn things over to Ruby then. Um, Ruby Martinez is, as I mentioned, our email archives building capacity and community fellow and is coordinating this grant program for us here at Illinois. Ruby's also a recent graduate of the iSchool here at Illinois. Ruby, I think you have some slides to share. Is that right? Yep, I'm getting them ready. I just need um, privileges. <laughs> and thank you both for your flexibility with uh, adjusting the agenda. We, we're really grateful.
Okay, so hello everyone. As Chris mentioned, I am Ruby Martinez, the Email Archive Community Fellow for the Email Archive Building Capacity and Community Regret Program, also known as the EABCC for short. I'm excited to provide you with a brief overview of our regret program funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Today, you will be hearing about the current development of email archiving in the context of our program that is hosted by the University of Illinois. But before I get started, I wanted to ask everyone to participate in two quick polls by clicking the link in the chat. And so the first, uh, what is the phrase to describe your experience with email archiving? I just want to gauge how vast responses are across members. this thing, um, this whole live update. So it might take you a while. You can feel free to skip the name portion um, at the beginning of the poll. <laughs> so clearly uh, these are not so positive replies, I hope that you will feel a little bit more at ease with all the work that is being done after hearing this presentation. I'll just give it a minute to keep for that to keep going. So our next poll, which is poll number two, this is the last question. Which of the following statements best describes email archiving at your institution? I recently did this poll at another conference and there was a mix of responses. And let's see how this appears today. Yeah, so still, still a mix of responses. <laughs> So your responses can visually represent the need to build email archiving capacity so that more institutions and organizations can move away from answer choices like A and B and onto C and D. We really want to see email archiving accessible from everyone from smaller state institutions to community archives and local government. So we're hoping that with our program, we can move towards that a little bit more. And thank you so much for your participation. It really means a lot. Give me a moment, it's not letting me go to our next slide. Okay, there you go. So the email archiving, archive building capacity and community program had its origin and works recommended by the Future of Email Archive Report published by Claire in 2019, Clear, sorry, and funded by, also funded by the Mellon Foundation. So the EABCC program is a four-year regrant program with two funding cycles. The first funding cycle has already been completed and you will hear about the five uh, programs funded in round one. The program as a whole provides grants of 25,000 up to 100,000 to support work that solidifies the community of email archiving institutions and makes it possible, in fact, for a wider range of institutions to adopt some of those existing tool sets or to extend functionality and integration possibilities between tools that are already existing. The feature of email archive report has several recommendations that are put into practice from the first round of awardees. So here's a preview of our project website um, on the first, this slide, and it provides a brief description of our regrant program. With our regrant program goals, we have three main goals for our program. The first two of these are really complementary to each other. The first one is to focus on specific improvements to make it easier for email or, um, or for institution repositories, archives, libraries, what have you, to improve their processing workloads. The report noted existing tooling gaps and identifying the, that processing workload for email archiving were complex. So that's goal number one, filling in those gaps and kind of making it easier to use the existing tools and building integration pathways between them. The second goal aims to bridge an existing gap by developing a community of practice so there's a baseline amount of activity that most archives can undertake to identify, preserve, and provide access to email materials and collections. Many repositories are still looking for a need uh, for a need that baseline of practice and the grant program here that the our grant program and the work we're talking about today are intended to fill in some of those gaps. 
And finally, I'd just like to note that the overall program has a fundamental goal of bringing attention to emo archives and broad, broader society and the community as a whole. We want to raise the profile and say that email collections are important and deserve to be preserved, even more so because they have multiple uses for historical research and current accountability and meeting society's needs generally. So with that, I'm moving on to the first round of um, overview. This program is very exciting because it supports programs that can meet our goals and move the community forward. With the first round, there was a focus on tool development and filling in some of those existing gaps that I mentioned. We have five awardees that had a strong emphasis on sustainability and building capacity outside of their own organization. So for the second round of funding, we we're hoping to see more grants that focus on implementation of the tools and specifically on capacity building. Currently, we are in the review period and looking forward to communicating those results. Like I mentioned earlier, we have five awardees and I'm happy to provide you with a very brief overview of their programs before we hear about COSIS Prepare project. So EPAD Plus, the project led by Harvard University, is intended to integrate long-term preservation functionality into Stanford's open source EPAD tool. The added preservation functionality combined with EPAD's existing archival processing framework will develop a and workflow that will export a standardized package that is directly importable into various digital preservation repositories. The project also targets depth that will save all the headers and maintain the original order for multi-parts, all of which will improve existing workflows. The University of Chicago Library is building a tool to convert attachments in email, another issue in email archiving. As I'm sure you know, many emails come with attachments. The common practice was to preserve attachments in their native format, which has since shifted. This tool will preserve attachments in more preserv preservable formats like PDF, and this method will be reproducible for adding in additional source formats and target formats downstream. It is also being done in a way that allows for the integration of those outputs into preservation package of email and an entire collection. So this next project is very exciting. It's led by Columbia University and their history lab. Unlike the other projects, which are working towards building systems to preserve email in its native format, this project comes from a different angle. This project demonstrates how journal journalists receive an email, usually in PDF and other formats. The problem with this is that most of the metadata is not intact in the emails that they are requesting. So the project does a couple of things. It convenes a panel of experts to identify a corpus of really important email that have been requested by journalists or others about the COVID-19 pandemic and governmental responses to them. It then tries to aggregate them in a way and convert them in whatever format journalists get them into a more preservable, preservable preservation format. So let's say if they get them in the PDF, they're converting those PDFs into inbox or other preservable format so they can increase access to them. Uh, this also demonstrates the value of email archiving for the historical community and society at large. And it also really provides great press and input for us and the community as well. So Mailbag, which is um, led by the State University of New York, Albany, one of the issues many archives have is that it's very difficult to think about a single master format for email because you might be acquire, acquiring it from multiple sources. In one case, the only, the, the only thing that you can get is a PDF message, like, exa for example, the uh, journalist that I mentioned earlier. And it is an email, but it's not in an email-like format. Also, the project recognizes that email is a very dynamic object, like a website, so it might include content that is pulled from multiple services or service, servers, but con this content may not be renderable if, we wait, if you wait too long to capture it. So this project finds a method to preserve these multiple masters, masters or input formats with inbox and EML files as data, and it provides a good document structure as well. So there's a way for all the files to be replayed and distributed to people in a more stable packaging format. And this all eventually gets wrapped up in the bagot format. And so the nice thing about this project is there's really strong emphasis on interoperability and development of tools as a microservice. And so it can be in, integrated into other services such as EPAD. So I would like to then turn things over to Michelle now and, and Nick, who are the leads on the Code to Prepare project under this grant. And I'm really excited to hear what they have to say more about their project. Ruby, thank you so much for your thorough 
description of all of the projects. It's it's so helpful to have that um, in people's minds. And I would just like to mention that um, we are also trying to, to increase the connections between the projects. So um, the last project that Ruby mentioned, Mailbag, is going to do a focus group webinar with COSA Siri um, State Electronic Records Initiative folks this fall in which they're going to get some feedback from the state and territorial archival community about what elements um, of mailbag that they're currently in development for would be most, most fruitful, most exciting, most helpful. So um, if you're at all interested, keep on the lookout, that'll be happening this fall. Moving on to, as Ruby mentioned, the COSA Prepare project. We are, the Prepare is a, um, in fine COSA tradition and acronym, we are preparing archives for records and email. And we're really thinking about this in a five pronged approach. Um, early on in the project, I was describing this as a, a five pronged trident and it was um, corrected that trident actually means three prongs. So that won't work. So we're really thinking about like a fork, like a frog gig or some other five pronged fork. Um, we just completed the needs assessment. The needs assessment survey was um, something that allowed state and territorial archives to identify their strengths, um, the roadblocks that they find, their challenges to um, acquiring, archiving, preserving, and providing access to email collections of their records. Um, we have just finished the draft of the needs assessment report and it's going to graphic design. Please be on the lookout for that next month as well. Um, we will be broadcasting it widely so that you can see what we've learned through the needs assessment survey. The needs assessment survey has also given us some insight into what documents we need to create um, to make clear what the best practices are for transfer, accession, and preservation of email records. This will build off of some of the work that COSA has already done around transfer. Um, but be focused specifically on email records. The next thing that we are embarking upon right now is developing uh, testing protocols. We wanna really be able to do an apples to apples comparison in an archival environment. We want common data sets, common amounts of time, common amounts of staff intervention, so that we can really say, um, create something that will help archives make informed decisions about the, about the options out there. We'll be creating an evaluation document of the email processing software performances pros and cons, and um, archives can use those suggestions for uh, making their processing software decisions. We are also working, Ruby mentioned, um, that these projects were building on the expertise of the organizations that we that had been awarded them. And uh, COSA has a, a long history of developing and strengthening uh, communities and doing um, mentorship and assistance across different archives. Um, so what we're looking at, and, and uh, Meg actually mentioned the, the NARA um, strategic report. This is also the, the series strategic report here. I'm sorry, the strategic plan. Um, and one of the wonderful things about this regrant is that um, it, it not only is something that COSA has a history and a strength in, but it ties so tightly to COSA's strategic plan for the future. Um, one of the things that Siri is looking to do in the next five years is work directly with state and territorial archives to help them establish the foundational documents that they need in order to preserve their state electronic records and specifically for this grant, their state email records. So um, COSA is going to be working with specific state and territorial archives. Nick and I will be working with those those archives to help them develop um, their 
workflows, their policy documents, all of the foundational pieces that they need in order to start taking email archiving to the next step. Um, I like, I do a little bit of gardening and this year I learned that the, um, the blossom of a flower is supported by something called the calyx, the, um, not, not the stem, but the part between the stem and the flower that helps the flower present its best self to the world so that it gets pollinated by the bees and the, and the butterflies and the other insects. And so Nick and I are kind of conceiving of ourselves and our assistance in this as being the calyx, that we are helping the archives present their best preservation policies to the world, to stakeholders to get pollinated, um, and, that, and that we are providing some of that additional support that will help strengthen their, their practices. And then the fifth prong of this is community. Make the community of email preservation a little larger. Um, bring in new state and territorial archives um, that maybe didn't answer veteran on Ruby's poll, that maybe said, this is something that we find challenging. We're, we're dipping our toe in it. Um, this is something that's new and we're trying to figure out how we can meet expectations for that. So we're really looking at, um, there's, there's a strong community of practice. There's states and territorial archives who have been doing email preservation for more than 10 years. We wanna make that community larger and make sure that all of the states and territories are connected and working together to expand knowledge, expand uh, understanding of practice, um, exchange information, refine the materials that we're producing, support the mentor relationships that we're developing between various states and, and territories, and, and really um, deepen those connections as much as possible. I will say as a side note before I sign off and, um, and hand things back over to Tom, Nick is not here today because he has a new baby. So he um, very much is, is dedicated to this, to this project and, and you'll be hearing from him in the future. But right now he's um, a little busy. <laughs> so thank you so much. And I'm turning it back over to Tom. Michelle, thank you very much. Uh, Chris, Ruby, we are really excited uh, about the, the work that you are doing in uh, sort of tending these fields. Uh, uh, and hopefully you will produce a wonderful harvest of great archival practice and technique. Um, and then we'll be all be able to uh, incorporate words like calyx in our daily discourse. Um, I'm just trying to riff on your comments, Michelle. So thank you. But we have we have about five minutes. Uh, I feel very supported, Tom. Thank you. <laughs> uh, you're in, entirely, entirely welcome. Um, so sometimes it's good to farm out some of the humor. Um, some of us live in a silo. Uh, anyhow, enough of that. Um, you know, what is the last, the, the worst form of humor are puns. Um, so we have a couple of minutes. Are there any, um, <laughs> David, any, any questions uh, for Chris, Ruby, or Michelle before we move on? Well, we're all going to hear a lot about this. And I, again, I, I think it will be very impactful, especially uh, the, the total spectrum of tools that people are developing, some of which are right up being developed right up the street from where I'm sitting right now. Um, we all are facing this challenge of electronic mail preservation, and it really is one of the next big mountains that uh, archivists have to climb. And uh, you're, you're really helping us quite a bit. So thank you very, very much. Uh, so with that, um, I don't think we've heard back from our colleagues at IMLS yet. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to Ann Ackerson, who's going to talk a little bit about the calls to the states and uh, the summary of what we've learned in that conversation that we have with one another every year um, and also talk a little bit about the efforts by the by COSA to do our strategic planning for the next to guide us for the next five years. So Anne, I'll turn it over to you. 
Thanks, Tom. Hi, everybody. Uh, could you give me screen sharing, please? Thank you. So the Council of State Archivists is the only organization that I know of that undertakes an annual one-on-one -on -one call to its members, not only to ask how archives are doing, but to also elicit support and information about programming and services. And this year was no different. The calls were made by COSA board members as they usually are. And this year, those calls were conducted between June and July. And as this slide shows, 73% of states, territories, and the District of Columbia archives were successfully contacted. The conversations revealed a decidedly different tone from those held in early 2020 when the pandemic was taking hold and the public sector was beginning to grapple with the potential scope and effects of COVID and how, how that would play out in government operations and in state budgets. This year's calls stand in stark contrast to the uncertainties of a year ago. 100% of members contacted reported that their agencies managed pandemic restricted operations fairly, fairly well or quite well. Fears of budget cuts and layoffs dominated the 2020 conversations as you can imagine. Much of those fears were unrealized as it turned out. 83% of members reported this year that state budgets and funding for archives were stable or flat, and 10% reported that the financial picture was trending upwards. There were a small handful of, of states who reported that they received additional funds, uh, largely for special projects, uh, uh, um, primarily capital uh, prop, uh, projects. 61% of members reported that their capacity for electronic records management and digital preservation is good or very good. And that continues an upward trend in that category. Specific challenges in this area include, and these are not new to anyone, I'm sure, the need for more funding, more staff training, more training for state agencies, more tools and space, and working with central IT departments. Challenges with email preservation and gen building general operating capacity were also mentioned um, throughout that, that section of the calls. As COSA members rebound from the pandemic, most took stock of what their agencies were able to accomplish during the last 16 months. And projects included moving existing programs to online platforms, processing backlogs, creating or updating databases, research guides and inventories, undertaking strategic planning, and developing or updating continuity of operations plans. Additionally, many archives were able to carry on with varying levels of public service. Notable among the shifts in operations that will stay in place temporarily or permanently for some members are some level of remote work, research room access by appointment, and processes and tools developed in response to COVID that have proven effective. As member agencies fully reopen, it remains to be seen what the right balance will be between pre-pandemic business models and new ways of working, of which in-person versus online services and programs are the most notable. Goes to COSA programming was rated by 88% of members as useful or somewhat useful. Members wanna see more case studies, demonstrations, and more topic or time sensitive meetups, such as COSA On Demand, which is a, um, an informal meetup of state archivists to talk about whatever might be on their minds. Since 2018, members have requested that COSA's research and education activities remain focused on advocacy for the importance of state archives. And that has remained in the number one slot uh, for all those years. Um, archives and records management training and programming, number two slot, remain the same. And then the number three slot, remaining the same, workforce development. 
calls to the states is a time consuming, but deeply gratifying and motivating activity that provides the board, the staff, and COSA's many committees with unvarnished input on current work and directions for the future. And we're really grateful that so many um, of our members are willing to take the time to talk with us. These slides form one infographic that will soon be available for download from our website. So um, keep your eyes peeled for that. And we hope that you take the opportunity to download it and make it available to your colleagues. So I'm gonna stop my share now and just briefly uh, chat with you about strategic planning. Um, COSA is um, in the beginning stages of updating its strategic plan. And um, we have been busy uh, benchmarking allied organizations, looking at how they're structured, the kinds of programming that they undertake, um, budgets, staffing, committees, all kinds of things. And within those conversations, there are a lot of nuggets, uh, a lot of ideas that uh, could be adapted to COSA operations. So that's kind of, that's very exciting. And um, I'm in the throes of focus groups at the moment, um, and as well as doing some one-on-one -on -one, uh, conversations with, with state archivists um, as well. Um, we'll, we'll soon be moving into, um, oh, well, one other thing, the COSA board has been evaluating the current uh, strategic plan and kind of biting off a piece at every one of its monthly board meetings. And the COSA staff is doing the same. And come this September, the COSA board and staff will be taking all this great information that we've been collecting and will use it to, to provide a a context in which to think about the next three years of COSA operations. Our goal is to have a draft plan um, by uh, mid-October and so that it's ready to kick in uh, come the new year. So that's where things stand. Tom, do you have anything else you want to say about planning or any questions of, of me or anything? I never have anything to say, Anne. Uh, about it. So, um, well, I, I just do want to encourage uh, my colleagues. The strategic planning uh, process is really important to help us focus on what's important and what our membership needs and what state archives need to enable us to to move forward as as a community. And so, if you're asked to be on a focus group or have the opportunity to make some suggestions uh, to anyone that's either on the board or any anywhere, um, please take advantage of that opportunity and please participate uh, in that. When everyone does participate, the calls to the states is always very very helpful. But sometimes there are additional ideas and thoughts, um, and certainly as we develop the strategic plan, it, it's designed to help all of us. So please participate in that. I, I, I don't want to say I beg you, but uh, we really, it's really valuable. Well, one thing I forgot to mention was this year's calls to the states did include a few questions uh, regarding our COSA and strategic planning. So um, uh, we've gathered a lot of great information from our members and, and that's been really, really helpful. And it's just going into the hopper along with additional information we're collecting. So we, we have a lot of wonderful input now, but I, I a second Tom's suggestion that if you want to be in touch, please reach out to me. I'm very happy to speak with you. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions for Anne um, about either of these two areas, the calls to the states uh, or the strategic plan? planning activity. I do want to highlight one thing for all of you um, that is an important input to our strategic planning and, and all of that. And that's whoop, this tome, which is available on the COSA website now. And uh, it's, it's full of useful data um, that, that is in very informative and very helpful to all of us. Um, it is thorough as it always is. Um, and we're very grateful to um, Veronica Martzel who put it together for us, but there was a whole committee as there always is uh, putting those questions together. And I know a number of you and the calls to the states that I had um, provided some great feedback on 
that survey and the survey that we did this year, both in terms of what it, how it was structured and how it operated, but also some of the questions that we did ask and some of the questions we didn't ask. We have a couple of minutes. Uh, if anyone has anything they want to bring up, we got we have a little bit of time. Um, Tom, may I have a few minutes to talk about our grant from IMLS? Um, I just heard back from Anthony Smith and he apologized. He had the wrong date written on his calendar, um, which was probably my fault as much as his. So he wanted me to convey his apologies and we will schedule a time with him, I think, where we could have the state archivist have a discussion with Anthony and some of his staff about some of the grant opportunities that IMLS has for archives. Um, I think many of you who are on our mailing list may have seen that COSA received an IMLS uh, National Leadership Grant, which just started this month. We got notification, you know, at the end of July, and it really just started this month. Um, and it is really going to do a lot for uh, COSA and our members. And I love the Michelle's example on the word. I can't remember, but that's really what COSA will be doing with this grant, too. We'll be um, providing information and uh, best practices documents, guidance documents on not just email, like in the in the grant, the subgrant from University of Illinois, but on all digital preservation projects and digitization for uh, important records that are in each, each of the states and territories in DC. Um, so we're really looking forward to getting that started. You'll be hearing from all of us about that. Um, another important component of that is we're going to also provide information for all of our members and some training from Helen Wong Smith, who um, is sort of well known for doing cultural competency training and assistance so that when we're looking at digitization and digital preservation plans in the states and territories that we can incorporate diversity, equity and inclusion in those plans as well. And Helen will be leading us through that. So we're very lucky to have her working with us and very lucky to have this uh, grant from IMLS uh, for the next three years to help um, our members improve their digital preservation planning and digitization work. And it's also, it's a modeled quite a bit on our email project because it, it um, does some of the same things that we're doing with that with mentorship and uh, developing communities of practice. So we're really looking forward to working on that. And since the news is fairly new, we've just sent out one announcement about it. And we've got, we, we had on our uh, project plan to spend the month of, October, of August organizing. So we're getting organized and then you'll be hearing more from us about it. And we're also, since Anthony is not here and I'm not sure if Chris Prom is still here, but uh, the University of Illinois also received a national leadership grant in which COSA is going to participate about um, PDFA, like testing PDFA. I'm, I'm not sure of all the uh, technical aspects of it, but we're gonna be working more with the University of Illinois on that part of their grant. Thank you. Well, thank you, Barbara. It, it, it is really exciting, all the things that are happening all at the same time. And it could be that this, the, the 10 years after the pandemic are the years in which our ability as archivists in general, state government archivists in specific, to address the real complex problems with digital record keeping happens. You know, <clears throat> it'll be fun to be paying attention to what's happening in COSA in 2032 and seeing how far we've come. And so thank you all for the work that you're doing that's gonna bring us there. Um, and it's exciting to be here at the very front end of some of those enormous developments. Um, there aren't too many any questions coming out. So I, I think one the last thing we're gonna talk a little bit about here is just to say thank you. I know there. this is a great collection of all of us. Uh, almost most of the states are represented here at, at this conversation and uh, as well as our supporters. I, I see Family Search is here and APPX is here um, and I know some others are here. So 
this kind of get together, even though it's virtual now, is a great opportunity for us to, again, strengthen the community that COSA really is and to learn from each other and support one another and see what's happening that we can join in and, and help move our enterprise forward. So if there's nothing else that anyone else has to say, I'll close this out by saying to all of you, all of our presenters, uh, thank you so much for what you've shared today and what you're going to share and do with all of us over the coming years. Thank you to our supporters and our sponsors for all of the support that you give to COSA and the work that we do in State Archives. We really enjoy working with you and we look forward to continuing those partnerships. And the last thing I'm gonna do is what's on this slide. Next week, uh, the annual business meeting where we do real business, big business, important business. Uh, so please mark your calendars to come uh, once again at three, between 3.30 and 4.30 Eastern, which I think uh, for Karen Gray in Alaska is two days before we actually meet. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll have another great conversation. So with that, um, enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Bye, Thank everybody. You. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. What was your word again, Michelle? Calyx. Is it with a C or a K? It's C-A-L-Y-X, Calyx. That's going to be really useful. Thank you. Well, it would be a good crossword puzzle word if you had <laughs> any crossword puzzles that you were doing. <laughs> that you were you designing. All. Bye, everybody. Thank you.